You're listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. Gemma King. She's here to help shed some light on a term that might appear to be purely descriptive of a multiplicity of identities within the tapestry of Frenchness, but actually has some built-in connotations of purity and what it means to be truly French. D'origine. All right, welcome back to the podcast to Dr. Gemma King. Uh, Gemma, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Well, my name is Dr. Gemma King. I am a senior lecturer in French studies at the Australian National University. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm Australian. But I spend my time teaching French language and researching French culture, uh, largely cinema, but also sort of broader cultural studies that look at the intersection between Frenchness and the French history of multilingualism, post-colonialism, where things get really messy. <laughs> they absolutely do, which we saw last season when Gemma came on to talk to us about francophonie. And today we're going to talk about a related word topic, which is d'origine. So d'origine is a fun one. It's d apostrophe origine, so of origin. But Obviously, it has a much deeper meaning in France. So we're going to sort of get into a lot of the nitty gritty of this, but just from a purely syntactical perspective, d'origine, how do you sort of interpret or translate that? Yeah, so of origin is the literal translation, and we, we use it to qualify identity in France. So instead of saying, for example, Uh, in the US, we'd often talk about having hyphenated identities, like being Chinese American or African American or Korean American or whatever. In France, we'll often talk about being Francais, mais d'origine algérienne, for example. So talking about where your, your family heritage may come from, where you may have migrated from if you're a first generation migrant, where, what your ethnic or national background is. But it's often used as a kind of euphemism for explaining that you're not entirely, perhaps not entirely French. Talking about race in a very sort of blatant way in France is something that's very much a perceived, perceived extremely differently to what it is in a lot of the Anglophone world and specifically in the US. I know I think the same is true in Australia. Yes. In France, we don't talk about it quite as much. And often, you know, even more so than in the US where it's, you know, a microaggression to basically ask someone, oh, but where are you really from? In France, no one would really volunteer that information because whereas in the US, in a lot of cases, being African American or Asian American, or even on a smaller scale, you know, being Moroccan American, Italian American, you are sort of laying claim to a community. In France, there's no community link to having that sort of, as you said, hyphenated identity. And I remember working on an article for the BBC when I was writing about the best baguette in Paris contest, because why not? And I interviewed a baker of Algerian origin. So I remember this baker I was talking to saying he had origins. And it was so hard to translate because it's a cultural concept that we just don't understand in in the anglophone world of saying we have or well of course everybody has origins but in france that means something else it is that euphemism that you were talking about that was so interesting when you told me that story because i'd never heard of the word being used in that way i'm used to hearing somebody who you know was either born in algeria or whose parents were from algeria of algerian descent saying je suis d'origine algérienne but i remember you telling me about that that interview where the baker specifically said, j'ai des origines, I have origins. Not even des origines algériennes, but just I have origins from elsewhere, which I felt was less about describing a specific identity and more about euphemistically suggesting that their identity doesn't align completely with a sort of pure original notion of what it means to be French. 
I must say I was a bit sad when you told me about that because it, it's it seemed like a case of kind of absorbing that euphemistic language that that isn't sort of proud to claim multicultural or international heritage, but it also is not surprising at all in the French context. Absolutely, and I think you know it's it's when you said pure, I think that's a really interesting misconception that a lot of French people, immigrants to France have about Frenchness and often, you know, having origins is being positioned in contrast with being a Francais de souche. So mm. S-O-U-C-H-E and souche is down to sort of the, the root stock. So a, a pure rooted Frenchman. But of course, that's a problematic mindset as well for a number of reasons. So if you when you hear that sort of juxtaposition between Français d'origine, I mean, let's continue with this particular example. So Français d'origine algérienne versus Français de souche, what do you see as the sort of main connotation that someone's seeking to to draw between those and what makes it so problematic in your eyes? Mm, that's a great question. I mean, Français de souche for me, while it's not a slur in itself or not not sort of um, an, an offensive term in itself. It does contain, for me, a lot of xenophobic assumptions about what French identity is and really draws that idea back to a, an extremely long timeline of French heritage and history. So souche is is soil, it's territory, it's land. And it refers to, you know, this ancient territory that is now called France and has been called many other things, has been part of the Roman Empire and before that was Gaul. And so, I mean, I think we've all heard the the synonym for French or sort of the old fashioned synonym for French as Gallic, meaning, you know, hailing back to, to Gaul, which was a Celtic territory, series of territories that covered what is now France, covered parts of what is now, or perhaps all of what is now Belgium, I believe, parts of what is now Switzerland, parts of what is now Luxembourg, so that kind of Western European region that lasted up until the first century BC when Julius Caesar came and claimed the, the region for the Roman Empire. This Celtic land of Gaul is I mean, ancient and and Gallic language was Celtic and unrelated to, or relatively unrelated to, to modern French. But that historical sort of ancient heritage just has a massive amount of cultural currency for French people today. So it makes me think of... Um, I mean, I think you know I was going to bring this up, but uh, was it in 2016, Nicolas Sarkozy, former French president who was sort of an anti-immigration right-wing French president in the late 2000s and who continues to kind of have a a platform in France, uh, in 2016 was talking about immigrants to France, describing the sort of assimilationist policy whereby, and he said, Dès que vous devenez français, vos ancêtres sont gaulois. So as soon as you become French, if you're assimilated into France as an immigrant, from that moment, your ancestors are the Gauls. Which is very interesting because Sarkozy is a second generation migrant of Hungarian and Greek parents, but insists on this mythical heritage of ancient Frenchness stretching back to Gaul as being the the roots that you mentioned before, the root stock. You know, if you're truly French, then you can trace your ancestry or pretend that your ancestry extends back to the Gauls. Right, which is problematic in and of itself because Sarkozy was frequently during his presidency compared to one of the two Napoleons, to Napoleon Bonaparte, the better known of the Napoleons. But actually, in sort of evoking the Gauls like that, he makes me think of the second Napoleon, so the second emperor of France, Napoleon III, we skipped Napoleon II for complicated reasons, but... Excel reasons. <laughs> well, yeah. So Napoleon III, in the middle of the 19th century, was trying to refocus the reg- the innate regionality of France, basically, on Paris and to give, just to sort of unite France under one banner, as it were, and essentially told people 
that they were all descended from the Gauls and sort of kindled this unifying national mythology of being descended from these great Gaulish warriors, put up tons of statues of this chieftain, Vercingetorix, and put his own face on Vercingetorix to try and unify the French people behind <laughs> this idea of the Gauls and behind himself, which is something that Julius Caesar used to do too. So you have, I mean, something, sorry, something that Napoleon I used to do with regards to Julius Caesar. So it's this idea of taking your own current countenance, imposing it on a mythology, and then telling people that this mythology is true. So this whole idea of the French being descended from the Gauls, there's probably very, very little to no Gaulish blood left in France because of what you said earlier about the Romans conquering. So it's this idea that we're having linking ourselves. And we, I talked about this a little bit on our episode on terroir. If anybody has missed that one, go back and check it out. This idea that you have of creating this identity as it's linked to the soil, to the land, as you said. And so it's it's really interesting to see Sarkozy still playing into that mythology that, I mean, any any academic worth their salt can look back and, and disprove in moments. It's fascinating, isn't it? And, and such a modest way of attempting to revise history by placing your, your face on the statues of, of so modest. <laughs> millennia old uh, figures. But it is so interesting to, to understand that this sort of myth of nos ancêtres les Gaulois, our ancestors the Gauls, as being so powerful in France. And that's where we get the, the icon, the image of, of the rooster, the Gallic rooster that is so associated with Frenchness. You know, I'm sure you've seen it in relation to like football iconography. Um, we have Le Coq Sportif, which we all know as like a, um, a fashion brand that recalls this idea of the, the rooster as France. And of course, the rooster is linked to Gaul. It's a symbol of Gaul. It's quite um, challenging to then understand that actually this popular myth of all French people de souche uh, are descended from the Gauls to then look back and see that it's actually a 19th century construction, which itself is a sort of a follow on from the 18th century sort of unification of France and French language and French identity under the revolution. It's a similar kind of impulse to attempt to unify and homogenize the French nation language and cultures for political purposes. Absolutely. And the other element of that that I sort of see in this in this quote that you've shared from Sarkozy, which is just fascinating, is of course that as soon as you become French, your ancestors become Gaulish, which means that we are your ancestors are no longer whatever it was that they were, be it, you know, Australian, American, you know, Laotian, Cambodian, Algerian, those roots that you had in another country are now effaced. And that's something that we really do ask of immigrants to France is not necessarily just kind of adjusting, but really assimilating to France. And I think that's why, as you mentioned, the French don't really have this tendency to hyphenate their identities the way that we do in the US or in Australia. Are there any other ways that you can sort of see that becoming French and becoming, I'm saying becoming a French citizen, but also being asked to make these cultural adjustments can erase any of your other identities when you become French? Mm. Yes, that erasure is is essential and perhaps the most nefarious side of, of this issue. It makes me think of the fact that while all um, non-Francais de Souche, if you like, people who emigrate to France or are descended from immigrants to France and are asked to assimilate, you know, you're completely right that we ask it of everyone. But it's also more possible for some than others to be accepted as assimilated. So I'm thinking of, you know, if we want to think about celebrities that have been assimilated or that are that have origins, that are of d'origine étrangère originally and have been kind of absorbed into the French culture and who were French citizens. I mean, I always think of the example of Serge Gainsbourg. That's a bit of an old-fashioned reference, but... You know, Serge Gainsbourg, famous um, chanteur, sort of icon of French 1960s, 70s pop music, very associated with kind of stereotypical, even aspirational 
Frenchness, Parisianness um, during his career. You know, he was of, of Russian Jewish origin and his parents were from Russia. Uh, but because of his whiteness and because of his sort of francophilia and um, aligned identity and look, um, it was more possible for him to to assimilate into French culture and to be considered French. Um, Charles Aznavour is always an interesting example because I think that's equally true of him, famous singer, but he was of Armenian descent and continued to to speak of his Armenian identity throughout his life. Um, but then we think about, you know, actors like Omar Sy, sort of one of the biggest actors in, in France uh, at the moment, who is of who is French. He was born in, in suburbs outside of Paris. He identifies as French, uh, but he is of d'origine sénégalaise. His family is of Senegalese descent. And it is really interesting to look at how Omar Sy is portrayed in France in relation to Frenchness. Um, you know, it's not as easy for a visibly black man to be fully accepted as French, even if he himself describes himself in that way and is sort of willing to culturally assimilate and view himself in that way. So I think it's important when we talk about this, and that comes back to your discussion with the Algerian baker who can't necessarily pass as white and French in the way that Serge Gainsbourg could, that we that we ask people to assimilate in these ways and to adopt Gaulish ancestry in a hypothetical way, but that we do not always allow them to actually achieve that in society's view. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Terroir Podcast, co-hosted by me, Emily, and Caroline Connor of Wine Dine Caroline. Each week, we take a deep dive into the food, wine, and more of a different region in France. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. The examples that you highlighted are really interesting because Charles Aznavour changed his, he, he France, Frenchified his Armenian last name to become easier to pronounce, to become more French in its appearance. And you actually are asked that when you become a French citizen, if you'd like to franciser your name. So for example, I spell my name with a Y at the end. And when I was becoming French, they asked if I wanted to change my name to be spelled the French way. But then, I mean, with my, with my way of doing it, my name wouldn't have really changed very much. There are people who are asked, you know, would you like to change your name to something completely French? Would you like to change your name from I don't know if Serge Gainsbourg was asked if he wanted to change his name from Gainsbourg to, you know, Dubois or something that sounds extremely French. And a lot of people do opt for that. Gainsbourg was a, uh, a francisation from Ginsburg. Was it? Okay. Mm. From Ginsburg, of course. Okay. I should have, I should have seen, that, seen that written into it. Of course, it does, it does maintain that sort of, you can tell from looking at the name that it's probably of Jewish origin, but you're right. It does then become that but Bourg, B-O-U-R-G, instead of Berg, which would be spelled with a, with a U or an E. Mm -hmm. And I do think also that, you know, we spoke in our episode about laïcité on this podcast in the first season about how you're asked to keep your religious beliefs to yourself in France as well. So it's that whole idea of just tamping down any identity that doesn't seem to align with what is this like Again, I'm going to use that word that I think is is appropriate and yet so problematic, which is this like very purely French identity. It's anything that can take away from your pure Frenchness is something that we don't really want to talk about. And I think that's why, as you so rightly highlighted, someone of a visible minority descent, so someone like Omar Sy or someone like Gad Elmaleh or someone like Jamel Debouz is is more difficult to assimilate into into a French de souche French without origins, which is so silly because <laughs> we all have origins yeah. into that sort of French French identity. I'm wondering if you have any sort of thoughts on how this mindset might be compatible or incompatible with the sort of black blanc bleu, black blanc Beurre myth that we sort of ha saw coming forward in the 90s in France? Mm. I mean, in some ways, the, the Black Blanc Beurre myth was a welcome opening up 
of the possibilities of Frenchness and, and ways in which one could be French. You know, the black bon, but oh my God, it is hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard to say. It's hard to say quickly. <laughs> it's, it's code switching as well because it's got an English word in it. Black blanc beurre, you know, of course, is is three colors in reference to the tricolor. So it's an idea of the possibility of racial difference being compatible with the bleu blanc rouge of the French flag. I mean, we have talked about the sort of risk of erasure that comes with that as well. And the idea that if one is to be black, black or beurre, one still must be French. And so, you know, being black, blanc, beurre, being um, this sort of acceptable multicultural identity in France still doesn't really allow you to also be, for example, Algerian or Senegalese or Russian, Jewish or whatever it may be. Like there's still that limit within the term that requires you to continue to identify as French. And I don't want to impose my outsider perspective too much because for some people that is a really important and valuable form of acceptance for them in France. And I don't want to suggest that people should continue to identify as Senegalese or Franco-Senegalese if that's not, you know, a compatible identity for them. Like we were talking about um, on our last episode, we were talking about the um, the Coupe de France and the fact that when Americans, uh, what was it, Trevor Noah, the South African-American journalist who, who joked about Africa winning the World Cup um, because there were so many black blanc beurre, so many uh, multi multicultural, multiracial players on, on the French team a strong response from the players themselves, the players of colour on that team, was, well, no, Africa didn't win the World Cup. France did because we are French. Um, And so I'm very aware of my positionality coming in with an Anglophone perspective and with a sort of favourable view of hyphenated identities um, that I don't want to impose on French people of colour. You know, I don't want to um, undermine the validity of identifying as French in those circumstances. But it does still highlight the fact that racial difference, race and identity, even when kind of overtly accepted in the French context, are still absorbed into a single notion of Frenchness. And that is con- continues to be the ideal. I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, that... that feels very i i appreciate what you say about not not imposing uh, an an ideal that comes obviously you know you're australian i'm american we've both lit, spent a lot of time here immersed in the french culture but obviously we have a different worldview and a different perception of this and and both of us being white as well is is an important role for this to play um i am curious to sort of dig a little bit deeper into kind of the history of the desire to unify the French identity, because I think that it's very easy to look at this and to see the same kind of racist leanings that we're perceiving in the U.S. I think that the motivation behind this desire to streamline the French identity while having very similar repercussions on people who want to or don't want to um, ascribed to multiple identities, you know, that's a personal choice. I think that the history of it in France is really distinct from the history in Australia or in the US, this history of streamlining identities, because it really seems to me to come down to a fear of communautarisme in France, this like ascribing to a smaller community within the larger whole. I don't know if you have noticed that in your in your research, is there sort of a, a, a historic precedent for why in France we might fear the founding of smaller communities within the larger tapestry of French society and identity. How do you always know to predict the exact thing that I want to talk about next? (laughs) Because I've known you for way too long. (laughs) Thank you for that uh, perfect segue. Yeah, I did want to talk about this word communitarisme, which has been really um, politicized and even militarized in 
French society in previous years, especially since 2015 and the the various terrorist um, attacks of that year. We saw this word really deployed often as a way of condemning cultural difference, racial difference, ethnic difference in France. Communautarisme doesn't have uh, an exact translation in English, but as you said, it's like the, the danger of people separating out into distinct, perhaps closed groups that might be hostile to the broader um, nation of France and broader French culture and identity. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a myth. It's, it's a myth. But it's kind of a, 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 a more pejorative extension of the idea of multiculturalism, which, while popular in countries like the US and Australia, is, is very unpopular in France. Um, and we think about this concept in relation to immigration, often post-colonial immigration in France, that has kind of recent a recent history since um, since the nineteenth and twentieth century for the most part. But I've been discovering in my research recently that this sort of anti-communitarist, anti-individual cultural groups impulse is ancient in France and extends from you know, the the revolution back in that France has never been a territory with one culture or one ethnicity or one language. And so the sort of former Gaul has always been made up of, of distinct regions with their own identities. So, if, you know, probably the most obvious example would be Bretagne, Brittany, that has its own language of Breton, which is being really actively revived in the community and in the culture recently and and um, in literature and, and in street signs and in local government policy, you know, Breton identity and, and language is, is being revived. Other languages are smaller and less possible to revive because of linguistic suppression over the the centuries but we have you know regions like um basque country which extends into france and over the border into spain you know further problematizing the idea of a national border um same of catalan you know the areas we think of catalan as being you know barcelona and the surrounding region but there are french catalan regions around perpignan where catalan is spoken um, you know, we could talk about Corsican. That's a whole other super complex situation. Um, but also Les Longues Duales from the from the north of France and over the border into Belgium. Like France was always multilingual, and I've been talking about this in my in my research lately as the multilingualism within, in that the myth of the Français de Souche, the myth of Gaul, the myth of one Frenchness, has always been a myth. Well, Gemma, I don't know if I can say anything else. <laughs> to, I think that's I think that's really just it here. I think that's something that we can take away from this episode and that we can bring into our understanding of the way that French navigates multiple identities is we've been trying for a very long time in this country to to pretend that we all come from the same place and that's why it makes it so much more uncomfortable in France to have people who ascribe to or who remind us in their in in their incarnating of a visible minority who remind us that we aren't that that is a myth um, and so that's why you don't have French people who say in the same way that Americans say oh I'm Irish American I'm Italian American I'm Korean American I'm African American and they're proud of it you don't have that in France because to be a good French person you have to be French and kind of that's it <laughs> Because we've been trying, I guess, to to quash the multiplicity of our identities for, as you say, as as pretty much as long as France has been has been a country. That's right. Well, Gemma, thank you so much once more for joining me on the podcast. I always appreciate having your insight. And can you tell our listeners where they can find you if they want to read more from you? Are you on the social medias? I sure am. Um, <laughs> I am on Twitter, Gemma with a G underscore S underscore King. Um, I do very similar kinds of rants on there, so please join me. Or you can visit GemmaSKing.com. Thank you so much, Gemma. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. 
This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.